I have a, a very unusual title for my message this morning, and uh, hopefully I can explain why. The title is Eat My Dust. So if you'll turn to Genesis, the second chapter. Verse number seven, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, able to take a breath, amen. Over the years, I've, I've pictured in my mind, you know, God spoke everything into existence, and then he knelt down and he sculpted man out of the dust of the crowd and became very personal and knelt down and breathed the breath of life into man and Adam came forth. And then in chapter 3 and verse number 19, it says, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. We're just here on a temporary basis, folks. Don't make any permanent plans except to live for God. Lord, we ask your anointing and blessing on your word. Touch it. Allow it to become alive in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God spoke everything into existence. But when he came to creating man, well, God molded Adam from the dust of ground, and he said that he would breathe the breath of life into his nostrils. It sounds pretty personal to me. God got up close. When God formed the church, he did exactly the same thing. He got very personal with you, didn't he? Each of us received the Holy Ghost, the breath of eternal life. Yes, we were living creatures, but we weren't alive to God. But when God formed the church, he became very personal. He put his lips upon our lips, and all of a sudden, we began to speak in another language. The same way the Holy Ghost means the breath of God. God breathed that breath into each of us personally, one person at a time. That's how personal he is. But this breath was so that we would become spiritually alive, not just live, you know, in the flesh. Have you ever wondered why God used dust, you know? Uh, he could have used wood. He could have used stone. Uh, I prefer gold myself. It lasts longer, you know, than, than dust, you know. The most precious thing on the face of the earth is you and me. And yet God used a building material that is just so common, more common than anything else. God said, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Dust is everywhere, folks. The dictionary defines it as fine, dry particles of matter. Um, women really hate dust. I, I've noticed that. They just despise it. They have end dust and they have feather dusters. They have all kinds of things in order to get rid of dust. Um, this last year has been a horrible year because people have cleaned more than ever before. They've disinfected. There's more products to clean up and get rid of dust. But recently, there's a study that suggests a dusty home may be a healthier home for your children. Dust is good for kids. That's what the study has shown. According to this study, not sponsored by Hoover Vacuum Cleaners, uh, but uh, this study, apparently, early exposure to germs in a household just helps children uh, build up 
strong immune systems to all kinds of germs, protecting them from developing allergies and asthma. Man, if your wife complain about the dust in your home, you can simply say, it's for the kids, honey. <laughs> There are some people with uh, dustless homes, and I think we should call the health department because they're really putting their kids at risk. This study was conducted in Germany where many uh, farm children were exposed to germs and they found that they were healthier than anybody else. Uh, maybe that's why they call it Germany, you know? <laughs> Nobody's on the drums, you know? <laughs> but they had fewer problems with allergies. And the side effect was farm children aren't allergic to hard work either, which is good. I, I remember being in Germany and in the middle of December, it was very cold. And as we drove down the road, there were windows that were open and, and comforters that were thrown out of the window and and every morning, they open up all of the windows to bring in fresh air and dust into their house. And it seems like they are healthier as a result. Where could you get to get, go to get such valuable information this morning without a charge? The scriptures proclaim that we were created out of dust, just plain old dirt, and when we die, our bodies decompose into the same thing that we were created in, into dust. One little boy, after the preaching, came up to the uh, pastor and said, Pastor, I heard that you said that we're made out of dust, and then when we die, we return into dust. And the little boy said, you better come to my house and look under the bed because there's someone either coming or going <laughs> The word dust is used 102 times in the Bible. There is much biblical emphasis on the fact that man is composed of mere dust. Isaiah 64 and 8 says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we art the clay, that's just dust with water, and thou art our potter, we all are the work of thy hands. You see, God needs somebody that's easily molded into what he wants, the image of God. God is constantly molding us into what he wants us to be. Uh, he couldn't do that with any other material. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. This is uh, the resurrection chapter, if you will. And uh, there's much comfort in it. Starting in verse 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So we're, we're born in the natural, but we have to take on that... Uh, of the spirit. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed for this corruptible, this dust must put on incorruption, and this mortal, this dust must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death 
is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Hallelujah. These bodies of Christ are just temporary housing for the breath of God. And as it said, flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There has to be a change. We're not going up to heaven in dust balls, folks. We're going up in glorified bodies. So there must be a change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trump. And we're going to be gone. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's look at some scripture. Philippians 3, 21. Philippians 3 and 21 says, Who shall change your vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? There's a prototype. It's Jesus Christ. After his resurrection, he was able to walk through walls. He was able to eat. People would recognize him. But death is gone according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. And then if you'll turn to 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John 3 and 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Jesus. Amen. And then Psalms, chapter 17. Psalms, chapter 17, and and verse number 15. David says, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Amen. We're going to be like Jesus. God wants us to conform to his image here. But when we're going up to heaven, we will truly have his image. We will have the same glorious body as his glorious body. You see, dust is a scriptural symbol of poverty, loneliness, and humility. God created us in humility. That's exactly what he loves. It also reminds us that there is nothing inherently eternal in our human bodies. There is an end. We wear out. It doesn't last. We have to look to another world. All of the exercise and all of the diet, all of the vitamins cannot keep us from our greatest enemy, which is death. But we are more than just physical beings. We have eternity within us. We are uh, slated for an eternal body. From birth, we have an inborn instinct that longs for immortality. We want to live forever. That's why people struggle to do whatever they can in order to have a longer life. But what they're in essence doing is they're saying, I want to live forever. That's because God has designed us in his image to live for eternity. It is built within us to say, I've got to live more than 70 years, more than 80 years, more than 90 years. I want to live, I want to be alive for eternity. And even though we, we know everyone eventually dies, death always seems to be unfair and complicated. We, we hate the thought of it because God wired our brains with that desire in order to live forever. The problem is most of the world doesn't know how to live forever or get to the place where they have that promise of eternal life. Turn to second. Corinthians, chapter 5. Paul, 
does such a great job of explaining that this is not all we have to look forward to. There is a, a much, much greater promise. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, temporary residences, were dissolved, we have a building or structure of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house or this new body which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. That somehow I want to live forever. If, if you're putting all of your emphasis on this tabernacle, this life here, it's a sad thing because you got to get all you can right now because there's no future. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest how in our bodies. He's living and he's always going to be living and that is going to be our future as well. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. From the very beginning, God designed us to be vessels that could house his spirit. And man has desperately tried to fill that void with stuff and not God. We find this void in us that, well, it, nothing satisfies. Nothing satisfies except the knowledge and residency of God in us. A relationship with God and the infilling of his spirit that gives us spiritual life. We're all walking dead before we walked into a Pentecostal church. Oh yeah, we were moving and talking, and, but we weren't alive in the spirit. We didn't have the hope of eternity in our life. No wonder Paul said in Acts 17 and 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's where we really become alive. Take a look at uh, 1 Samuel, the second chapter. First Samuel 2 and, and verse number 8. He riseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. We may not look like much now. We may not look like we're much to the world, but is he setting us up to be princes and, and judges and rulers of this world? Hallelujah. Paul captured this thought best in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Second Corinthians 4, starting in verse number 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I, I mean, you know, when God created Adam and consequently everyone after it, he could have made us permanent bodies here, um, you know, something really special that would never wear out. But, but we have this treasure of God's breath, his spirit within us. So the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. For we which are alive are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. I, I have a hope within me. When you're filled with the awesome presence of God, you have this immediate hope that this is not the end. It's, it's just a starting place for eternity. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, and we need to understand the value of this life, but especially the value of eternity. We all have a, a limited amount of time in these dust bodies. We, we want to preserve it as long as we possibly can. But what really counts is what do we do with the temporary bodies? What are we going to do with the the small amount of time that we have here on earth is just a dressing where, room where we, we put on the robes of eternity and we only get one chance in order to do this. We can't have regrets at the end of our life, folks. Amen. Uh, if you'll turn to uh, Psalms 30, I know we're using a lot of scripture. Psalms 30, and starting in verse number 9. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me, Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O oh, my Lord God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. You know, one of the greatest things you can, you can give God is our praise and, and what it, David is saying, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare the truth? As long as I'm alive, I've got great value in worshiping God, you see? Do I want to prolong my life? Maybe I should worship God more because that's the value of these years here. Psalms 104 and 33, David said this. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. God, my, my only value here on earth is to be able to give you glory, give you praise. Psalms 146 and 2 says, While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praise unto my God while I have any being. Glory to God. I want to be valuable to God. <laughs> and the best way to do that is start worshiping him. When your eyes open in the morning, start worshiping him. Before your eyes close at night, start worshiping him. There's one final detail about dust. In Genesis, it details with, um, deals with the ultimate enemy of man, and that's the devil. Because of his past in the deception of the fall of man, God uh, cursed him with a very unique curse in the third chapter of Genesis. Remember my title, Eat My Dust. When, when you say, eat my dust, we're meaning, we're winning, you see, we are that's because in a race or, or when a, a runner is running or a car is speeding, 
uh, it'll produce a, a cloud of dust that everyone else has to run through or drive through, and then they have to breathe the cloud of dust because you are ahead of them. Eat my dust. I'm winning this race, you see. Glory to God. So in, in, in Genesis, the third chapter, <clears throat> Genesis 3 and, and verse number 14, It says, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I'll tell you what, we are winning this race We'll always be ahead of the enemy. We'll always be ahead of sickness. We'll always be ahead of death because death, where is your sting? You see, these dusty old bodies are going to put on immortality and we're going to live forever. The devil is forced to take a backseat to us who are humble, who are lowly. Who, who have nothing going except we have this treasure within us. Church, we are winning the race. I don't know where you are this morning, but I'm telling you, we are winning the race. And in order to stay ahead in this race of life, we must be filled with the breath of God. We need to take another breath every time we come into a church. We need to worship God, and we find that we are topped off, if you will, with the Holy Ghost. Amen. The word breath in Genesis 2 and 7, where God breathed the breath of life into Adam, um, is rasha in Hebrew and pinoma in the Greek. It is the same word that is found in Acts, the second chapter, uh, in verses uh, 4 and also in Acts 2 and 38. It is the breath, you see. God bent down and breathed the breath of life into Adam, but he did exactly the same thing when he formed the church by hand, if you will, a rushing mighty wind that came into that upper room and all were filled with the Holy Ghost or panuna. Hallelujah. So let's look at those very familiar scriptures in Acts, the second chapter. I'm glad that these Bible studies aren't limited to this auditorium. I'm glad we're on YouTube now. I'm glad that some people are going to be able to see what the breath of of God is really all about, that it isn't just life here for uh, three score and ten, but it's for eternity. And verse one of that second chapter says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. That, that's the breath of God. And it filled all of the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, that word pumna, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. He, he exhaled. You know, he came to his disciples and he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Amen. And when this happened in the upper room, they knew exactly what was happening. It was the breath of God now that was coming in them. That wouldn't just give them 70, 80, 90 years, but would give them access to eternity. And when the rapture happens, God's just going to inhale. <laughs> and we're going up. Hallelujah. I don't know if you've ever read this before. Acts 2 and 38. 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the breath of God that will give you spiritual life. Well, it was for them 2,000 years ago. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. Hallelujah. How many are glad for the breath of life in them this morning? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. The thing about living is this. You got to keep breathing. You know? Can't be any obstructions. If there's an obstruction, they call the paramedic, uh, medics and, and they have to somehow get rid of the obstruction because without the breath, you'll die. The same thing is true for the spirit. Can't be anything that blocks the airway, folks. Amen. Got to keep taking another breath of God, another breath of God, another breath of God. Hallelujah. Until you hear the sound of the trumpet. Amen. Glory to God. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. How many people need new life? Glory to God. Amen. I wasn't there. Well, I was. But I wasn't aware of that first breath that I took. It's at that point that they declare that the child is born. And then there's generally a cry that comes out. But I was there for that second birth. When I was filled with the Holy Ghost, and then there was a cry that came out as well. Amen. Of a Father. Hallelujah. And I'm going to just keep breathing and keep breathing and keep breathing because I'm looking forward to eternity. Amen. The altar's open. Would you come? <laughs> 